Welcome aboard. Welcome to today's tour. Today, we are in Panola County, Texas. We are in a small airfield just outside of Carthage, Texas. On today's tour, we will be talking about and finding some locations associated with the country music star Jim Reeves. We will be talking about Jim's career and the tragic crash that took his life in 1964. Let me get the plane started and the cockpit set up and we will talk about our flight plan for today's tour. If this is your first time with us, welcome. What we do here at Dude Tours is find interesting stories and then we find some of the locations associated with that story right here in the flight simulator. We are not going to replicate any actual flight or the aircraft or the crash. Inevitably, someone will comment that we're not in the correct aircraft or we don't have the same instruments and that we didn't fly in the right conditions or that we never crashed. Today, it's about Jim's story and some of the associated locations with his life and career. With that said, today we are in the Beechcraft Debonair, the 35-B33. It's an American high-performance light aircraft that was introduced in 1961. The airplane is powered by a 225 horsepower engine and it was built between 1961 and 1965. And we are here today because Jim Reeves was born not far from here in an area near Galloway, Texas. We are at Sharp Field. It's two miles east of Carthage, Texas. The field has the airport code 4F2. It is a 112-acre site with one asphalt runway, identified in each direction as runways 17 and 35. The runway is 4,000 feet long by 75 feet wide, and it opened in September of 1963. Jim Reeves and one of his all-time hit records, Billy Bayou. Welcome, Jim. The masterful picking of the Blue Boys, made up of Leo Jackson, Mel Rogers, Jim Kirkland, and Dean Manuel. We will start our taxi. While we taxi, let's take a look at today's flight plan. We will be departing here from Sharp Field near Carthage, Texas. And first, we'll pass over to Berry, Texas, where Jim spent a bit of his time early on. Then, we will head to and pass over Shreveport, Louisiana. That's where Jim got his first real break into the music industry. From there, we'll make our way to Batesville, Arkansas. From Batesville, we will fly east towards Dyersburg, Tennessee, and then on to an area just south of Nashville. Eventually, we'll make our way north to Nashville International Airport, where Jim was intending to land. The airport was known as Berry Field at that time. Welcome to my world They read the good From Friday to Monday We are at the hold short line and we are now ready for takeoff. As we depart the airfield, we will pass over Carthage, Texas. Then we will make our way back towards the airport heading to the east and we will pass over the Jim Reeves Memorial. There's a life-size sculpture of Jim and it marks his grave on the one acre site here east of Carthage on US Highway 79. We are airborne. 
James Travis Reeves was an American country and popular music singer-songwriter. He became well known for being key in forming what is known as the Nashville Sound. He was also known as Gentleman Jim. His songs continued to chart for years after his death, and he is a member of both the Country Music and Texas Country Music Halls of Fame. We are now passing over Carthage, Texas. When Jim was younger, he spent time here. He attended high school here. As we make our way back towards the airport, we will pass over the Jim Reeves Memorial. Jim was born at home near Galloway, Texas, a small rural community near Carthage, on August 20th, 1923. He was the youngest of nine children born to Mary Beulah Reeves and Thomas Middleton Reeves in the family farmhouse where the family grew cotton and other crops. Jim's father was ill at the time of his birth and he would pass away in May of 1924. His mother, Mary, who raised the family, working in the fields alongside most of her children. Jim's older brother, George Buford Reeves, also took on the role of supporting the Reeves family. In Jim's younger years, he was simply known as Travis. The beginning of his interest in music started with his mother's accordion playing, and also when his brother Buford brought home a Victrola and he heard the music of Jimmy Rogers. James, or Jimmy Rogers, was an American singer, songwriter, and musician who rose to popularity in the late 1920s. He is known as the father of country music. He was known for his distinctive rhythmic yodeling, which was quite unusual for the music of that time. When Jim was five, he was in Louisiana with his brother delivering some cotton when he saw a couple of men playing music, and one of them had a guitar. Seeing the guitar, Jim knew he had to have one. When he got home, he tried making his own out of a cigar box and some rubber bands. Later, he would trade a basket of fruit for his first real guitar, a second-hand guitar that was in pretty bad shape. A local construction worker helped him repair it and taught him a few chords. The seeds were sown for Jim's future in music. In 1932, the Reeves family moved to DeBerry, Texas. While attending Carthage High School, where Jim was just as interested in sports as he was in music, he became a prominent player on the school's baseball team. Jim continued to practice his guitar, especially on the bus between his home and the school. After graduating high school in 1942, he received an athletic scholarship to the University of Texas. He enrolled at the university, but he would drop out only six weeks later to take a job. Jim's talent as a baseball pitcher earned him a shot at a semi-professional baseball contract. After some confusion regarding his military draft status, he was finally offered a contract with the St. Louis Cardinals farm team. He had finally received his F4 draft status in August of 1943. This was the status of unfit for military service. This could have been due to some injuries Jim sustained earlier in a car accident or a heart irregularity he was known to have or it is also understood that sometimes professional athletes were assigned this status as a way to allow them to keep playing sports. During the time that Jim's military status was in limbo, he did spend some time in Beaumont, Texas, where he played in Moon Mullican's Honky Tonk Band. Aubrey Wilson Mullican, known as Moon Mullican, was an American country and western singer, songwriter, and pianist. His playing style was known as Hillbilly Boogie. We are approaching DeBerry, Texas, where Jim lived starting around 1932. The family moved into a house that his brother Buford owned. In 1945, Jim started playing for the Lynchburg Cardinals. He compiled a career record of five wins and two losses and a 1.43 ERA in his 17-game pitching career, as well as 24 at-bats playing for the Lynchburg Cardinals, the Alexandria Aces, the Natchez Giants, Marshall Comets, the Henderson Oilers, and the Sherman Denison Twins, but an injury would eventually end his baseball career. In 1947, he met and married Mary White, a schoolteacher, who became an advocate for Jim to pursue music as his full-time career. After baseball, Jim began to work as a radio announcer, first at the station KGRI in Henderson, where his main duties were as an announcer, but occasionally he would sing live on the air. In 1949, a friend of Jim's introduced him to Macy Leela Henry and her husband Charles. They owned a small department store and also ran a small regional record label. And in October of 1949, Jim had his first formal recording session in Houston, Texas. In 1950, two singles were released, My Heart's Like a Welcome Mat with Teardrops of Regret on the B-Side and Chicken Hearted with I've Never Been So Blue as the B-Side. This small label, Macy's Recordings, was a small regional label associated with the Macy's department store chain based in Texas. It was a Houston-based label that released recordings of popular musicians around the southern United States. The limitation of these records only being released in the associated stores resulted in limited success for these early recordings of Jim's. 
1952, Jim made his way onto the Big D Jamboree, which was broadcast from the radio station KRLD in Dallas. Early on, they called it the Lone Star Barn Dance, but less than a year after it started in 1947, it became known as the Big D Jamboree. On one of his trips to Dallas, Jim recorded some demos of his songs and had them sent to Imperial Record Company in California. Jim also made contact with Capitol and RCA with no success. Looking to make music his full-time career, Jim and Mary left Henderson and moved briefly to Dallas. With little success there, they left Dallas and ended up in Longview, Texas, where Jim went to work briefly for the radio station KLTI in Longview and then KOCA in Kilgore. Jim had been trying to land a spot at KWKH in Shreveport, Louisiana, which was the broadcaster of the Louisiana Hayride, a radio and later television country music show broadcast from the Shreveport Municipal Memorial Auditorium in Shreveport. In light of not being offered a position at KWKH, Jim took his next position at KSIJ in Gladewater. During this time, Jim was extremely busy between the radio station and playing at a honky-tonk called the Rio Palm Island. The Rio Palm was located on Highway 31 in Longview, Texas. It was established during the oil boom days, leading to the rapid growth of dance halls and clubs. It featured special lighting, the best sound system, and the largest dance floor. It was decorated with palm trees and foliage that was brought in from Florida. The dance floor was built to accommodate 1,500 couples. The dress was formal, and the best of the big bands and swing bands played there. Jim eventually became the band leader for the house band. We are approaching Shreveport, Louisiana. Jim had landed a spot here working at KWKH Radio, a large station where he'd been trying for quite some time to get a position, and he got the job here in 1952. Shreveport was founded in 1836 by the Shreve Town Company, a corporation established to develop a town at the junction of the Red River and the Texas Trail, which was an overland route into the newly independent Republic of Texas. One of the members of the company was Captain Henry Miller Shreve, an engineer. During this time, Jim started to hone his craft, learning from some of the biggest names that were booked to play at the Rio Palm. Jim worked on proving his singing ability as well. Jim studied artists like Bing Crosby, Buddy Clark, and Herb Jeffries, who was a popular jazz singer-songwriter known for his baritone voice. Jim would go on to become the first baritone in country music. In 1952, Jim had finally succeeded in landing a spot at KWKH Radio in Shreveport, Louisiana. This was a big upgrade from the small-town radio stations he had worked at, and he had hoped it would be his gateway onto the Louisiana Hayride. KWKH was founded by W.K. Henderson, owner of Henderson Iron Works and Supply Company. Henderson signed KWKH on the air from his country home at Kennenwood, north of Shreveport, in 1926. Henderson developed a popular on-air persona amongst the station's listeners and a notorious reputation with the government regulators. He often sparred with the Federal Radio Commission over his profanity-laced rants. Henderson sold the station in September of 1932 to International Broadcasting Corporation. KWKH became affiliated with CBS in 1934 and in 1935, ownership was transferred to the Times Publishing Company. In April of 1948, KWKH launched the Louisiana Hayride. The Louisiana Hayride! Eventually, Jim filled in as a performer on the Hayride. A member of the audience the night he performed was Faber Robinson. Faber Robinson was an influential independent record owner and talent scout who started Abbott Records in 1951. Following Jim's performance, Faber signed Jim to Abbott Records. The relationship with Abbott paid off immediately for Jim. His second release on the label, Mexican Joe, reached number one in 1953. The records of Mexican Joe and Bimbo became the first chart hits on the Abbott label. Jim's Mexican Joe came on the country charts on March 28, 1953 and made it to number one where it stayed for nine weeks. It was his first charted song and his first number one. The single was on the charts for 26 weeks. Due to his now growing popularity, Jim went on to release his first album in November of 1955, Jim Reeves Sings, which proved to be one of Abbott Records' few album releases. Later in 1955, Jim was signed to a 10-year recording contract with RCA Victor by Steve Scholes. Steve was a prominent American recording executive with RCA Victor, 
He was the head of the country division and was responsible for recruiting such talent as Chet Atkins for RCA Victor. Steve went on to produce some of Jim's first recordings at RCA Victor. Steve was also the one that signed another performer from the Louisiana Hayride that same year, Elvis Presley. Jim's early recordings with RCA Victor relied on the usual loud Texas style of singing, which was considered standard for country and western performers of that time. But Jim had been developing a new style of singing throughout his career. What Jim was going to be part of with this new style was what became known as the Nashville Sound. He was helping develop a subgenre of American country music, replacing the chart dominance of the rough honky-tonk music of the 1940s and 1950s with smooth strings and choruses, sophisticated background vocals, and smooth tempos. It was an attempt to revive country music sales, which had been devastated by the rise of rock and roll. According to Larry Jordan, the author of the book Jim Reeves, His Untold Story, Jim's publicist at the time, B. Terry, is credited with encouraging Jim to use this new singing style. Jim decreased his volume and used the lower registers of his singing voice. The term Nashville Sound was first mentioned in an article about Jim in 1958 in the Music Reporter, and then again in 1960 in a Time Magazine article about Jim. Initially, RCA rejected this new style, but with the endorsement of his producer Chet Atkins, Jim was allowed to use this new style in a 1957 recording that had been originally intended for a female voice. It was titled Four Walls, which not only scored number one on the country music charts, but also scored number 11 on the popular music charts as well. This recording marked Jim's transition from country novelty songs to serious country pop music. Jim would become known as a crooner because of his voice and this new style, and it appealed to audiences that were not necessarily country and western fans. His songs, such as Adios Amigo, Welcome to My World, and Am I Losing You, proved the success of this style. In 1955, Jim also made his first appearance on the Grand Ole Opry. He also appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, The Steve Allen Show, and American Bandstand. In 1957 and early 1958, Jim did a daily live one-hour radio program at WSM Studios called The Jim Reeves Show. It aired on ABN Network, the forerunner of ABC, and it was carried coast to coast. About this time, he began to reshape his image as well, shifting from cowboy outfits to traditional suits and sometimes tuxedos. Jim's new softened vocals were prominent on his 1959 hit, He'll Have to Go, the honky-tonk tale of a man whose girl is at a bar with another man. He'll Have to Go had success on both the popular and country music charts, which earned him a platinum record. It scored number one on Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart on February 8, 1960, and remained on the chart for 14 consecutive weeks. The song was written by Joe Allison, an American songwriter, radio, and television personality, and a record producer. The result brought Jim international stardom. Over the next few years, he traveled to every state in America. He joined RCA tours to Europe from 1957 to 1962. In 1962, Jim toured South Africa. In 1963, Jim returned to South Africa to star in his only film, Kimberly Jim. Kimberly Jim was a 1963 South African musical comedy film starring Jim Reeves, Madeline Usher, and Clive Parnell. The plot follows an American singer who takes part in the Kimberly Diamond Rush in South Africa in the late 19th century. More specifically, Jim Reeves and Clive Parnell played con men who earned their living by selling medicine and cheating at poker. The two invest their winnings into a developing diamond mine. The movie's soundtrack had 14 songs, which included the songs Kimberly Jim, Strike It Rich, I Grew Up, My Life as a Gypsy, Born to be Lucky, Old Fashioned Rag, Diamonds in the Sand, A Stranger's Just a Friend, Fall In and Follow, Roving Gambler, and Dolly with the Dimpled Knees. Jim said that he enjoyed the filmmaking and would consider devoting more of his career to films. The film was released in 1965 after Jim's death. Jim's overseas record sales were impressive. He achieved gold records in New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom. He was popular in South Africa and India. During this rise to fame, Jim was known to be very kind, engaging, and accessible when it came to his fans, leading to him being referred to as Gentleman Jim. The airport we are approaching now is Batesville Regional, where Jim and Dean had flown into here in Arkansas to look at some property that Jim was considering purchasing. We will be landing here briefly at the airport. Batesville is the second oldest town after Georgetown and the oldest city here in the state of Arkansas. It was named for the first delegate from Arkansas to the Congress of the United States, James Woodson Bates. Batesville was an important port on the White River and played a large role in the settling of the Ozark Mountains region. Jim's last two recording sessions for RCA Victor were held on July 2, 1964. 
They produced the songs Make the World Go Away, Missing You, and Is It Really Over. When the session ended, with some time remaining on the schedule, Reeves suggested that he should record one more song. He recorded I Can't Stop Loving You in what would be his final RCA recording. Jim made one last recording at a little studio he had in his home. In late July 1964, a few days before his death, he recorded I'm a Hit Again. We are on the ground here at Batesville Regional. We'll take a quick look around the airport and then we will depart for Nashville. In July of 1964, Jim and his business partner and manager, Dean Manuel, who was also the pianist of Jim's group, the Blue Boys, planned to visit Batesville, Arkansas to look at some property that Jim was interested in purchasing. Dean was originally from Arkansas. Dean learned to play the piano on his own at an early age, and because he was self-taught and played by ear, he had developed a unique style of playing from the bass end of the keyboard. Dean's music career was put on hold when he entered the U.S. Army. He served for two years from 1956 to 1958. While Dean was re-establishing his music career after returning from the Army, he received a phone call from Jim in Nashville to join his band, The Blue Boys. Dean and his family moved to Nashville, and he became part of the Jim Reeves Blue Boys Band in 1959. He and Jim became bandmates, business partners, and good friends. The two were originally planning to fly out of Nashville on Wednesday, the 29th of July, but due to weather reports Jim had received, he decided to delay the trip until Thursday. The plan was to fly to Batesville on Thursday and back to Nashville on Friday. In the 1960s, Jim had decided to learn how to fly. He had been fitting flying lessons into his now very busy schedule. He would take a few lessons, leave on tour, and then come back to the lessons later when the tour was over. In 1964, a Beechcraft salesman, Fred Bunyan, was trying to get Jim interested in buying a Beechcraft debonair. The Beech debonair was first produced in 1959 and was a stripped-down, straight-tail version of the Model 35 Bonanza. It seats four, and the interior was a little more sparsely equipped to keep the cost competitive with the Piper Comanche. It had a Continental 225 horsepower engine with a max cruise speed of 185 miles per hour or 160 knots. The Beechcraft dropped the debonair name in 1967. Fred thought a good way for Jim to evaluate the plane would be for him to rent it out for some of his upcoming trips, and that is exactly what happened with his trip to Batesville. Jim and Dean left for the airport, known as Berry Field at the time, on Thursday morning. Jim performed his pre-flight checks, refueled the airplane, they put their luggage into the aircraft, Jim put in his navigational charts, and they boarded the aircraft. Jim fired up the engine, taxied, and they took off from runway 2 left. The two flew to Batesville, where they circled above the area where the land was Jim was interested in, and then landed at the airport. The Batesville Regional Airport is located on Highway 167 in Independence County, about four miles south of Batesville. The city of Batesville owns the airport, which is a public-use general aviation airport. It has the airport code KBVX. A service station, a general store, and a restaurant called the Airport Cafe operated at the airport in the 1950s and 1960s, which were owned and operated by Bill and Leora McDuffie. Dean was from the area and had family in Batesville. His uncle George Parks picked up Jim and Dean and brought them to one of the properties for Jim to see. Then they went to the motel where they were staying for the night and then went to George Parks' house for dinner that night. The next morning, they returned to the Parks' house before looking at more property. They were delayed a bit getting out to look at the property due to the fog and limited visibility. They were eventually joined by a realtor, and they looked at the property that Jim was considering purchasing to possibly build a resort. The area is known as Jamestown Loop, and it's near the top of a mountain. On the way back, they stopped to visit a friend of Jim's at Rimrock Records in Concord, Arkansas, and then headed back to the Parks' home. During the day, storm clouds started to form. Jim contacted the Walnut Ridge Weather Station to get a weather update. Jim was a pilot that relied on visual flight as opposed to instrument flight, so clear skies were required. Based on the weather report he received indicating storm clouds were already covering part of their route, he decided to get out ahead of the storm. The two hastily said goodbyes, went by the motel, and headed to the airport. They were in such a rush that Dean actually left some of his belongings at the motel. Once at the small airfield, Jim called Walnut Ridge again to get an update on the route further towards Nashville. Conditions were reported as clouds at 3,500 feet. Flying under VFR, visual flight rules, a pilot needs to see the ground. There are two options for a VFR pilot when dealing with clouds during a daylight flight. One is deciding on an altitude to fly so that you will avoid the clouds. The other is deciding whether the clouds along the route simply mean that visual flight is not possible. It was now approximately 3 p.m. when Jim performed his pre-flight checks, started the aircraft, taxied, and took off for Nashville. 
After taking off from the regional airport at Batesville, Jim aimed the airplane to the east and headed back towards Berry Field. Jim and Dean intended to fly the 280 miles back to Nashville in about two hours. Jim had received weather information from the flight services at Dyersburg Airport around 3.30 p.m. He may have been trying to avoid reported cloud cover at that time. At around 4.40 p.m., Jim made contact with Nashville's approach at Berry Field. He was about 30 miles west of Nashville and flying at 5,500 feet. At this time, there were scattered clouds at 4,000 feet, but conditions were still allowed for VFR flight. At 4.46 p.m., Jim was cleared to start descending at his discretion into Nashville. During his descent, about 16 miles from the airfield, Jim was informed of rain ahead of his current position. The controller at Berry Field advised Jim to make a right turn heading south of the airport to avoid the rain. Jim reported that he could see the precipitation, and it was to his left of his intended path, and he believed he didn't need to make the turn. The controller, monitoring Jim's progress, confirmed his position by asking him if he had passed by the television tower belonging to WSIX. Jim acknowledged that he saw the tower and he was still descending and only experiencing light rain. With less than three miles to the airport, it's believed that Jim flew directly into a forming thunderstorm. During a thunderstorm, clouds can lower drastically in addition to the usual heavy rains which can seriously reduce visibility. At 4.51 p.m., Jim radioed the tower and reported he was in heavy rain and had quickly lost visibility. He sounded panicked to the controller, and he said he couldn't get out of the rain. The controller believed that Jim would emerge from the rain in as little as a mile if he just stayed on course. We are passing by the Dyersburg Regional Airport here in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Jim received some weather information from Dyersburg on his flight back to Nashville. This is also the airport where Patsy Cline, Cowboy Copas, and Hawkshaw Hawkins departed from before a tragic crash took their lives in 1963. Speculation is that Jim could still see directly below him, and he was following the roads he was familiar with, which caused him to turn to the left, maybe to attempt to get back over Franklin Road. When the controller at Berry Field radioed him, asking Jim if he had made it out of the rain yet, Jim responded negative although the transmission cut out before the entire word was broadcast. That was the last contact between the tower at Berry Field and the Beechcraft Debonair with the tail number N8972M. Five minutes later, the Beechcraft airplane disappeared from the radar screen. The plane had disappeared in the Brentwood area south of Nashville. Marty Robbins, a country and western singer known for his hits such as A White Sport Coat and The Story of My Life, was at his home in Nashville when he heard a low-flying plane. He looked up and saw the airplane just before it went below the tree line. He heard the unmistakable sound of the plane crashing into the trees. John Moran, who also lived nearby, heard the engine sputtering and, like Marty, heard the plane crash. Several agencies and individuals began searching for the missing plane, including the Davidson County Civil Defense, local and state police, and other volunteers. The Nashville FAA said they had planes over the crash area just five minutes after the radar contact was lost. The area where the plane went down was home to several country music stars including Eddie Arnold, Chet Atkins, Ernest Tubb, Stonewall Jackson, and Marty Robbins. They all helped in the search for the missing plane. The search took place in the vicinity of Franklin Road, north, northeast of Brentwood. Although investigators had narrowed down the search area based on the testimony of multiple witnesses, they were unable to locate the airplane. Searchers hunted for the missing plane Friday night, all day Saturday, and began again on Sunday morning. On that Sunday morning, August 2nd, some 44 hours after the search began, civil defense investigator Bob Newton reviewed the testimony of Perrier Mims, who said the plane flew over his swimming pool and headed towards Radnor Lake. Bob drew a line from Mims' house to Radnor Lake on the local map. He then followed this path from Mims' house towards the lake on foot. Within a short while, Bob found the remains of the missing plane. The crash site was located just off Franklin Pike north of Baxter Lane. Investigators initially identified the two men by the information in their wallets. Country music star Eddie Arnold had been friends with both Jim and Dean, and he identified the bodies. Coincidentally, both Jim Reeves and Randy Hughes, the pilot of Patsy Cline's airplane, were both trained by the same flight instructor. On August 2, 1964, at 1 p.m., radio stations across the United States began to announce Jim's death. Double funeral services were held for Jim Reeves and Dean Manuel at 2 p.m. Tuesday, August 4, 1964, at the Phillips Robinson Funeral Home in Nashville. Thousands of people traveled to pay their last respects at the funeral. Jim's coffin, draped in flowers, was driven through the streets of Nashville. Jim was buried the following day in Carthage, Texas. Dean was buried also the next day in the Spring Hill Cemetery in Nashville. 
The Jim Reeves Monument and Burial Site has been one of Panola County's most popular tourist attractions, located just three miles east of Carthage on Highway 79. The monument is 12 feet tall, and it has a walkway in the shape of a guitar. Jim's beloved collie, Cheyenne, is also buried at this site. A great source for information on Jim Reeves' life and the tragic events that took his and Dean's lives is the book Jim Reeves, His Untold Story by Larry Jordan. Larry writes extensively in his book about the evidence which suggests that instead of making a right turn to avoid the storm, as he had been advised by the approach controller to do, Jim turned left in an attempt to follow Franklin Road to the airport. In so doing, he flew further into the rain. While preoccupied with trying to re-establish his ground references, Jim let his airspeed get too low and he stalled the aircraft. Relying on his instincts more than his training, evidence suggests he applied full power and pulled back on the yoke before leveling his wings. A fatal but not uncommon mistake that induced a stall spin from which he was too low to recover. We now will head over downtown Nashville, where we'll be able to see the Ryman Auditorium. The Ryman Auditorium, also known as the Grand Old Opry House and previously the Union Gospel Tabernacle, is a 2,362-seat performance venue, best known as home of the Grand Old Opry from 1943 to 1974. In 1925, the founder of National Life and Accident Insurance Company launched a radio station, WSM, named after their slogan, We Shield Millions. National Life built a small studio in its downtown Nashville office. And WSM went live for the first time on October 5th, 1925. A month later, they launched the WSM Barn Dance on November 28th, 1925. It became widely known as the day the Grand Ole Opry was born. Some of the Grand Ole Opry's most historic moments and performances happened right inside the Ryman Auditorium here. The Ryman was home to the Opry until 1974. The last show of the Grand Ole Opry at the Ryman was held on March 15, 1974. And then the 4,000-seat Opry House opened on Saturday, March 16, 1974. And we will be passing over the current location, the Opry House, before we head to the airport. That is a bit about Jim Reeves and the tragedy that took his life, as well as the life of Dean Manuel. Now let's head to Nashville International Airport, our final destination today. Now would be a great time to hit the subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. It helps the channel by letting YouTube know people enjoy the content. Now let's go get the plane on the ground. Some of Jim Reeves' top singles were Mexican Joe, Bimbo, Four Walls, Billy Bayou, and many, many more. Yes, I'm a hit again made it back in your top ten south by the border hey i know a lad he's got more fun than anybody's had yo bimbo bimbo where you gonna go yo bimbo bimbo what you gonna do yo bimbo bimbo does your mommy know railroad steamboat river and canal yonder comes a sucker and Four walls to hear me Four walls to see Blue boy, that's what they call me Cause I'm so lonely Back about 1800 and some a Louisiana couple had a red-headed son. Put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. I've gambled down in Cape Town, played cards in Bloemfontein. But I'm going back to Kimberley to gamble my last game. I'm just on the blue side of Lonesome. Right next to the Heartbreak Hotel Adios, amigo Adios, my friend The road we have traveled Has come to an end
We are on the ground here in Nashville. The Nashville International Airport has the airport code KBNA. As I mentioned, it was known as Berry Field at the time of the crash. The airport code BNA is short for Berry Field, Nashville. The airport is a public and military airport in the southeastern section of Nashville, Tennessee. The airport is served by 22 airlines. Joint Base Berry Field and Air National Guard Base is also located here at Nashville International Airport. Now let's find a place to park the aircraft and we'll take a look around the airport. 